Hi, Carl here for Pro V TV. So I'm at the BSC Show 2018 on our stand. Funnily enough, talking to Philip. How Hello. are you? You have voice holding out? Not really. No, it's it's Don't okay. Four hours of talking about this camera so far, so um, it's ah, still here. We appreciate it. So, well, you might as well explain what is this. This is the Kinefinity uh, Terra 4K. Uh, they've been around for a few years, and they've had a lot of interesting-looking cameras. And this one, for me, has been the most interesting so far. Um, and I think what you know, the, without question, first off, people notice the price. It's, yeah, I mean, it's hard to ignore. It's, yeah, it's incredibly cheap for what you get. Uh, and, and it kind of occupies a really unique place in the market because there's nothing else really like this at this price point. With the features and what it does and, and the build quality, it's incredibly impressive to have a camera which shoots 4K in slow motion up to 75 frames in full, resolu in, uh, full DCI. It can go even higher with a slight crop of vertical resolution. So that's a 2.35 to 1 sort of cinema scope yeah. crop. And if you, you want to go really high frame rate, it goes up to 260 frames a second in Super 16. So it has different crop modes for different things. The sensitivity to the camera, it's, that's one of the key things. And I think you know things like the Blackmagic cameras, the Ursa Mini Pro, is a really good camera. And it's probably its main competition really here. In the price, certainly, it's the main competition. But it's not an ISO performer. It's not great over 800. This one has dual sensitivity. Much like the EVA1, there's and 800 the and 3200, and the cool thing is it will automatically switch, which the EVA1 won't. So, you know, you're shooting a 800 and you're pushing it up. So when you get to 1250, it will switch to the 3200 native ISO. And and I've shot some test shots um, as high as it goes, which is just over 20,000 ISO, and even at 8,000, it looks really, really good. And at 20,000, that, that is. The yeah. big surprise, I think, for me, because yeah. it's a slightly smaller than Super 35mm sensor, it's a bit of an unknown camera brand. You're yeah. thinking, well, that's going to be the compromise. It's going to be noise performance. It's going to be a noisy camera. Yeah. Like, it's surprisingly clean. It is, and, and that's really important. You know, in a, as a documentary filmmaker, it's essential to have a camera which I can push. And then you can go times, outside the comfort zone. Yeah, I, you know, if, if it means getting the shot and not getting the shot, I will shoot as, you know, I, on the A7S II, I have shot at 400,000 ISO, where I absolutely need to get shot. There was no light. And it looked awful, but I, but I got the shot. It's better than not getting the shot. Whereas at 20,000, it's actually still really useful. But, you know, in reasonable levels of, say, you know, 8,000 ISO, it's amazing. Well, I mean, obviously you haven't done side-by-side -side comparisons and stuff like that, but what sort of level of other camera, just so people have got a bit of a, a, a level in mind for it, what other cameras have you seen with similar-ish performance? We're not talking A7S and GH5S. Within, within ISOs? Within ISOs. Within ISOs. I would say probably the C200 from Canon yeah. has a similar sort of ISO performance, very good. And I shot with that in a documentary uh, just over a week ago, and that did really well. And I was able to push that quite high. Uh, again, 10,000 easily. So, I mean, that's kind of what you want flexibility-wise. And, and this, the thing is, this camera, people are saying, well, who's it for? What are they aiming for? Is it the narrative market? Uh, is it... I honestly think it can fit into pretty much everything. I mean, it's that's really flexible. Yeah. Well, we should probably talk about the modularity a little bit, but it can be adapted to pretty much any use yeah. of video. You know, set up right now for a handheld setup. Um, it records in ProRes, uh, which, of course, is industry standard, 10-bit. So you have that, uh, you know, it's, it uses SSDs, has switchable lens mounts. I've got a speed booster on here right now, which gives me a 1.3 times. And that's the Kinefinity speed Kinefinity booster. Kinefinity is called the Kine Kine Enhancer. Enhancer. <laughs> so rather than the Metabone's actual speed booster. And that works really well. And there's a, there's a lens mount, which actually has a built-in variable ND for EF. Mm -hmm. Has so many lens mounts. For so many lens mounts. E mount, EF yeah. mount of varying sorts, PL, Nikon F. It's one of the reasons why I love the, the, uh, so the Sony uh, video camera so much is that E mount. It's so flexible, means I can put on anything I want. And it's one of the downsides for the EVA1 and the C200 is it's EF only. And the uh, Sony Pro? Yeah, of course, EF only. Whereas, you know, the benefit of the C200's EF mount, of course, is that autofocus, which this doesn't have. So yeah, there's, there's no autofocus. No, here. this is a purely camera. manual camera. Um, it's just got so much going for it. It's, the only thing for me is simply, it's just going to come with time. Is, 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 it, is it super reliable, which it needs to be? And that's going to come with me shooting. I'm shooting with it next week for the first time on a pro gig. Uh, I feel confident enough after testing. You should never 
do a pro gig um, without testing a, a, an unknown camera. And I tested it enough, and I'm feeling confident to shoot with it. I love the image so far, and I think it's going to look great. And I just love the size, the weight. It is remarkably small. That was Seeing it in person for the first time, that was the first thing that struck me, was yeah. that is a lot smaller than I thought it was. Yeah, they, you know, it's the brain itself, or the, let's not call it the brain, the, the, the body only, mm -hmm. you know, it's under, it's under a kilo and it's really, really small. So, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about modularity. Um, so there's the brain and then varying different mounts, which we've discussed. Yeah. This is the kinny back. Kinny back, which gives you uh, your audio inputs, it gives you all your professional connections. Otherwise, you've got HDMI only, but it gives you all of your SDI connections. It gives you your power out, it gives you a time code, it gives you all of these really important things to have. And the V-mount, of course, for course, for, for powering the battery. You've also got a side grip here, which get, replicates all of the controls on the side here, so you can access all of the camera settings, and it's removable, and you just put in a Sony BP battery, so if you're using it on a gimbal, for example, you can access all your settings from that. And it's not a proprietary battery, it's a, no. it's a BPU. Yeah. It's a BPU, yeah, I mean, it's... Normally with these cameras which are all modular, especially with red cameras, everything adds up to a huge amount. You know, I used to own an Epic M about six and a half, seven years ago. And it was an incredibly expensive camera when you start adding up everything. The same when I bought the actually the um, F55. With the media being proprietary, it all adds up. You know, this is this is an indie filmmaker's in theory, and hopefully it's an indie filmmaker's dream. But why not? Why, it's also a broadcast camera. It's a commercial camera. It's a corporate camera. And I think you know they could have. This could be a really big deal in the market. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us on our stand. Cheers.